Yeah. There you go. Is there a presenter there? Okay, perfect. Wonderful. We have people popping in. Welcome everybody, as you're coming in, we're gonna give it another minute for everybody to sign on. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat if you would like to, um, who you are, where you're at. Um, would love to learn a little bit more about who all is in here with us. So um, we will get started in about 30 seconds. And by the way, uh, how is the background of my, uh, I mean, I mean the virtual background of my screen, that's fine. Good, thank you. All right, I think most of the attendees who will be here, I think is leveling out right now, everybody who signed on. Um, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, Christina, well, the chat is disabled, it says. Oh, it is? Never mind. don't introduce yourselves. Chat is disabled. Um, I don't know if that's something Jason can change or if it's not able to be done. So um, hopefully we'll get that. So we will go ahead and get started. If we get the chat going, great, you can pop stuff in there. Um, we definitely have the Q&A option up. So if there's any questions um, that come up or comments, please feel free to pop those in there. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to quickly welcome everybody here to this virtual keynote. We're really excited um, to, put, to have put this together and that everybody's here to join us. Um, this is titled, A Conversation Between Global Leaders, The Imperative for Research Practice Partnership in International Higher Education. Um, as we know, a lot of times we operate in a lot of silos, right? We operate a lot with um, talking a lot about research or we talk a lot about practice, but not a lot of that connection um, between the research and the practice. So real quick, I also want to um, invite you to join us in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's not too late to register um, for the virtual um, it's for in-person or the virtual ticket taking place on November 16th through the 19th. So you could um, scan that QR code really quickly. Um, and this session is technically our keynote that is kicking off the Council for International Higher Education pre-conference. And I'm one of the co-chairs for that. So excited to be here and I'll pass it over to my co-chair. Everybody, um, this is Chung Eun Kim, uh, also a co-chair for this year's CIH annual, um, you know, conference. So, you know, as Christina mentioned, I really uh, am thankful for everybody who is present. Um, and also, uh, part of my job today will be introducing the panelists who we are very grateful for um, taking their time to join us and will share their um, observations and perspectives on the issues that we are going to discuss today. And Again, as you know, mentioned earlier, please use the Q&A um, anytime throughout the event so uh, we can actually continue the conversation and also engage with the panels in a meaningful way. So joining us today are Dr. Jit Joshi from AIEA and Professor Cesar gutierrez Suardo from um, MPI, um, Dr. Guang Xi Jane from API, and Joanna Regulska from NAFSA. So I'm going to let them do the short introduction for us. Um, let's start with Dr. Jit. Hello, everybody. I am Jit Joshi, as uh, Wang Jun said. Uh, my day job is at the California State University Long Beach as Associate Vice President for International Education and Global Engagement. And I am the incoming president of the association, uh, uh, the AIA. Uh, and then uh, I take my position in February. That's when our annual conference is. And I'm looking forward to a robust conversation today. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker will be Cesar. Hi. Good afternoon to all of you and morning in, you know, in, in different uh, places in the world. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the Association for Study of Higher Education for this kind of invitation to this uh, interesting webinar. Um, well, my, my name is Cesar uh, Gutierrez and I'm a um, uh, faculty at the Humanities Department in the Universidad Autónoma de Chihuahua in the north of Mexico. And I'm acting president as well of the Mexican Association for International Education. 
uh, for a second term. I've been, um, you know, I've been uh, acting as, as president, leading the initiatives of our association for about three years now. And uh, we're really interested to engage in this important conversation. Thank you. Next, Guang Sui. Hi, thank you. Uh, good morning and good good evening. Uh, actually, here in China, it's quite early in the morning. I'm uh, Zhang Guangcui, and uh, I'm currently the director of President's Office of Jilin University, which is located in the northeast part of China. And also, I'm the API Advisory Council, Council member. And former, um, it used to be the uh, uh, API director. I'd like to express my best regards to my friends old and new here in, in today's session. And also uh, I'm very interested in the uh, conversation uh, in, in the uh, com upcoming panel. And I feel honored to have this privilege to share my ideas and even more to learn more from you based on my 17 years of practical experiences in international higher education. Uh, and also I value this uh, opportunity to learn from the audience and also the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Joanna? Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, um, and good day to good night to everyone in between on every zone. Uh, my name is Joanna Regulska. I am uh, serving um, my day job is at the University of California, Davis, where I'm the Vice Provost and Dean of Global Affairs and also a faculty member in Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies. Um, and today I'm representing NAFSA, uh, uh, where I am a board member and also serve as a Vice President for Public Policy and Practice. And I'm thrilled to be with my colleagues uh, to share ideas and really to think about the future, what is ahead of us and how we can collaborate together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Again, um, you know, I'm so grateful to have everybody who are on the panel. Um, and so to get our discussion going, um, I'm going to um, ask the first question, which is, what do you see as one of the top issues in international higher education globally? Ji, do you want to start? Oh, okay. I was just wondering what order we're going. Um, so um, I would go ahead and you know start by saying that uh, we are living in a very interesting time uh, in the world today, and as everyone is uh, impacted, affected by what is going on in and around the world, uh, certainly international education sector is uh, experiencing it firsthand, you know, I would say. So the, the issues, the top issues that higher education institutions globally, and in particular, the international education sector is going through is a degree of uncertainty, you know, I would say, in, in, as a result of the geopolitical tensions that is um, you know, ongoing and uh, escalating, in my view, all of the different situations, the war, um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the impact of that is, you know, sometimes not, you know, widely spoken, but that it, it, it has a really deep impact in what we're doing in the international education sector. So, from a global point of view, those are uh, major issues I think that I see you know happening uh, in in you know these recent years and ongoing in my view and would probably last for uh, I don't know how long it'll last but it'll last for some time. And also there is a, another element from a U.S. perspective I would say is what is happening with higher education in the U.S. Uh, certainly is impacting. Uh, the global sector, the international education sector, mainly what I mean by the kind of the culture war that's taking place uh, in the context of uh, U.S. domestic policy, uh, the political situations that we're going through right now. We will have a midterm election in about a week. And, you know, also there is another, you know, aspect in this, you know, I would say that the, the perception towards higher education, the perceptions toward colleges and universities 
and the increasing voices where it is um, you know, articulated as the college degree is not important, uh, that you don't need to have a college degree, whether that is from a financial point of view and that comes in with the increasing student debt. Uh, and on the other hand, what is a good job? What does college prepare for the career of the graduates? And that is more of a US perspective, but that certainly impacts uh, globally in my view and how our students perceive uh, this you know, critical need to be educated uh, about other cultures, other issues, especially issues that are broader and that are, you know, uh, has global, you know, impact. Uh, so it, the whole notion of colleges are not as valuable as traditionally they have been thought of uh, is, is impacting uh, in what we do on a daily basis right now. Am I passing on to Cesar? Yeah, that was out. Well, if you're ready to go, Cesar. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I was just up, you know, thinking how the format was going to go, if, who's going to be passing the word to each other. So, well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, sharing these thoughts. Um, and I'm, I'm going to tell you, I mean, on the Mexican perspective, or, or I mean, I can go further uh, saying on the Latin American perspective about, uh, you know, uh, what do we think that are the, you know, the main issues or, or top challenges in international higher education globally uh, within our context in Latin America, right? Um, you know, uh, while the challenges presented on the, or the, I will say the so-called still present COVID-19 pandemic, um, they have been daunting for education in general and in higher education specifically. So institutions have implemented like innovative way to meet those challenges, right? Regarding the internationalization of higher education and its international cooperation variable, institutions have presented a wide range of responses, you know, ranging from reactive, temporary, and merely tactical, um, you know, um, strategies to exemplary cases of interactive and strategic responsive with a long-term vision. So basically the common scenario for all educational institutions has been defined by an environmental, I'm sorry, by uh, an environment full of uncertainty. That is the, you know, the, the common term, uncertainty and restrictions that have limited physical mobility and therefore academic states of any kind. So likewise, the preventive confinement of institutions that were forced to close their campuses led to the academic staff and students to conduct their learning processes from home with the usual limitations due to the, uh, you know, technological developments, uh, quality of internet connections and service of other means. As you, uh, as you, I mean, uh, may already know, in Latin America, uh, we have, a, you know, um, a big gap between uh, the society that have the means to have good connection, to have the, you know, the facilities, the technological um, devices, and as well as good connection to, to go online and continue this uh, endeavor of uh, internationalization of higher education. So basically, um, there is a really good example of what we, um, you know, developed during the pandemic, and we are foreseeing a, um, you know, a, a stronger collaboration in Latin America to present ourselves as a hub. Um, back in early 2020, uh, you know, the Network for International Collaboration in, in Colombia got us together the, I think the six most prominent associations uh, focused on international education. So it's RCI School in Colombia, Red Sin and uh, Fiesta in Argentina, Fobai in Brazil, um, Ready Peru in Peru, Learn Chile in Chile, and Ampe in Mexico. And we created what we have called INILAT. So it's, it's, it's actually uh, a network 
of networks, I will say some, some, something like that, that um, are working basically in what can we do in order to, you know, to move ahead and, and turn the page of, the, of this uh, uh, catastrophic pandemic that have uh, inhibited somehow the physically mobility processes that we had and have led us to the big opportunity to embrace technology and to reduce the gap, you know, between those that can afford uh, to have the opportunity, uh, you know, to uh, uh, and engage in processes such as uh, uh, COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning or Big Core Exchange uh, processes, and those who can do it because basically they don't have the means in Latin America. So uh, what we think so far is that, um, you know, the usual, uh, the usual limitations due to the, to this big gap that I'm uh, talking about, um, demand or institutions in Latin America, uh, you know, to both embrace the education and demand that they have traditional serve, as well as the new demand created by the reduction of borders and distances achieved by the new 4.0 technology. So I think those these are critical issues right now in in basically in our region in, in Latin America that uh, we are we are facing but we are trying to do something and and later on during our talk I'm gonna give you like a specific examples of what I've been doing so far and I know that uh, from the perspective of the practitioners we need to somehow connect with the scholars right what are we doing to keep uh, the opportunities for all of our uh, university uh, communities, either faculty, staff, and, and you know, authorities in our higher education institutions. So I will pass the word to my fellow colleagues. Joanna, would you like to, to share your ideas first? Or... Okay, I will, maybe I will take the opportunity to share and uh, uh, I, I value the ideas from my uh, co fellow colleagues just now very much because uh, actually I totally agree that the international higher education is faced with a uh, uh, quite challenging, uh, uh, how to say, quite challenging situation. And also the uh, information and digital technology has made us enabled to even a, a, a wider uh, vision for the international higher education. I think if, if we talk about the uh, one of the top issues in the international higher education globally at present, for me, one key word is pandemic. Although I know that in the um, uh, in other countries, uh, out, I mean, in the world, in a lot of countries in the world, pandemic is uh, uh, how to say, affecting not that much to the physical uh, allocation of the students, but I am I still see the long-term uh, affection because, uh, you know, um, the mobility, the, the formation or the, uh, um, the forms of the mobility of students have been changed silently. Uh, before, actually, we could see large number of students, they enjoyed the uh, traveling, uh, and uh, they enjoy the life, I mean, the life in, in other countries. And also they enjoyed the courses uh, on, the, on the campus of the universities. But now more and more open access for the uh, online courses, online webinar, like what we are doing now. And also the information online are available for the students. Just um, uh, take an example in China, uh, last year, I saw over 10,000 students from Jilin University, uh, you know, attending the online courses, online meetings, online workshop. But before the pandemic, uh, what was the number for the students who travel abroad? Every year, we have over 5,000 students travel abroad to the, uh, uh, to the other parts of the world. I know that the face-to-face uh, -face meetings and the uh, physical allocation for the students in the other countries will, will benefit them a lot. But, you know, for the students, 
they are now try, trying to get benefiting on the online uh, resources. Thanks to the digital and information technology, actually, we can also see the other side of the coin. You know, uh, taking advantage of the uh, uh, technology, everybody could sit in the first row. We face, we can talk to that, each other just like we are in the first row in the classroom. And also we have the uh, virtual conversation with everybody we could see online. And also we, we could have as large as possible the audience who could communicate with us anytime. Like, uh, like here now for me, early in the morning, five o'clock, I, I could talk with my fellow colleagues online. And then just uh, in, in, in an hour, I could go to, go to work as uh, regularly. So I think now for the uh, international higher education, especially for those international higher education practitioners, I think <clears throat> the top issue for us is to really think about what, what kind of the changes are facing us and also what kind of the uh, countermeasures for us uh, that we could take to uh, really provide the resources to the younger generation. Information, technology, experiences, ideas, and also I, I, I think other sustainable resources like funding and also like uh, the uh, uh, faculty members, uh, uh, how to say communication, uh, uh, contribution and etc. But another challenge for us is that there are so much, so many resources online, how to attract students and how to help the students to find out what kind of the resources will be the right ones for them. That's also a challenge. So Joanna, I'd like to hear more about your ideas. Well, so very, very quickly, uh, because uh, probably it's great to for us to, to keep on moving and addressing different topics. <clears throat> but many of you already brought the question of uh, student body, and I think it's important for us to acknowledge that the student body is much more diverse, not only in terms of uh, race and ethnicity, but also age. We have uh, different uh, students, single parents, veterans, those who have work experience, first generation, older student, and so forth. Which brings me to what NAFSA is doing. Uh, we are working a lot with the colleagues and staff members of international offices, uh, both in the United States, but also around the world. And um, our staff members need to engage in new learning. Our staff members need to understand what are the needs of our students? What are the new management practices that we should uh, employ? What are the needs now that the international education has some challenges that you've already mentioned? So how do we think about new pedagogy given how our student body is diversified? How do we move some sort of faculty focus uh, learning approaches to actually learner focus uh, approaches so we can engage our students and meet the diversity body of students. As a result of that, NAFSA is doing numerous of projects um, and initiatives like e-leadership institute and academy, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about uh, practices that we employ. But Ultimately, what we want to make sure is that whatever we engage in, there is sort of society relevant outcomes that we build new opportunity for experiential learning for our students for global learning opportunity. And given this changing demographic of our students, but also, as we just talked, given technology, given the new opportunities that technology. And finally, uh, for those of you who uh, know uh, about the United States, uh, there has been two uh, very important parallel processes going on. On one hand, 
we embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion, or justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, JEDI. On the, one, on the other hand, we have rising nationalism. So there is this tension that we as an international educators have to address. And NAFSA is very much committed to DAI and the kind of work that we do to really bring the understanding, the recognition of cultural diversity, but also make sure that we all engage and we understand and we recognize cultural humility in order to move the field forward. I will stop here and I'm looking forward to, to our next round of conversation. Wonderful. All of you gave us a lot of things to think about. Um, so my next question, the follow up then will be what are ways that scholarship and research can be done or can be used to address these critical issues? I ask that because a lot of people in the audience are um, scholars, researchers. There's also a lot of um, current doctoral students who maybe are looking for some good dissertation ideas. So based on what you talked about, what are some things that you think, hey, this is how scholars can help us address some of these issues that we We've talked about. And we'll start with Cesar. Thank you so much. So in regard to this one, I think this one is a, a critical um, question in this, in this webinar. And I'm going to tell you why, because, um, you know, we, again, as, as practitioners uh, leading, you know, the, the important international education associations uh, worldwide have a, you know, a strong uh, responsibility and commitment in how we create pathways, you know, for the scholars, for the faculty, for the researchers to help us, you know, uh, move forward the internationalization ladder, how I, I used to call it. Um, for instance, uh, it is critical to have hard data that may help us, you know, to design accurate, accurate strategies to be discussed with educational authorities in our regions, in our countries, in our nations, and, and, and you know, and to put on the table this uh, hard data information for the decision makers, you know, to design uh, in regards to the development, the development of public policies. I mean, because these are critical public policies that are sensitive to this new scenario of constant uncertainty. Because I mean. In this case, it was the pandemic of COVID-19, but who knows what is coming next? Maybe there may be another pandemic. Maybe there be there may be another uh, big global challenge that we need, uh, you know, to be uh, careful to have a strategic data that the researchers may, uh, uh, you know, help us to to gather this information in order to make, um, you know educated decisions about uh, public policies in regard to internationalization of higher education. And, and, and let me tell you a, a clear example of that. In the case of what I was uh, aforementioning in the region of, of Latin America, considering at least these six big economies in, in, in Latin America, um, Peru, Mexico, uh, Brazil, uh, Chile, Argentina, mm -hmm. uh, and Colombia. Through INILAT, we just launched an important in initiative, uh, which is uh, something uh, that honestly hasn't been done in, in the past. And basically, it, it, um, we uh, promoted a collaboration among uh, different uh, faculty in these six countries. And uh, through INILAT, we, we, uh, we just uh, launched during our conference a couple of weeks ago, a, a, it is kind of a, a report of the state of the art in regards to public policy for in, basically in these six countries. So through different uh, faculty, for instance, Dr. Santiago Castillo with Seton Hall University in, in the US, uh, another colleague from Universidad de Guadalajara in Mexico, Roxana Chapa with Universidad de Tarapaca, and um, in different colleagues in, in Brazil, uh, Peru, Argentina, Chile, and, and, the, and the countries that I uh, aforementioned, we designed this report, um, you know, as a, an idea to engage the faculty in researching 
what is being done so far in regard public policies to promote the internationalization of higher education? What are the uh, strategies that the local and regional governments have developed in order to help us to guide these, uh, these processes? So um, this, um, this initiative, as I aforementioned, was uh, just launched a couple of weeks ago in the Spanish version, but we're about to launch the English version in a collaboration with the Center for uh, International Higher Education in, in, in the Boston College with Gerardo Blanco. So uh, we aim to launch the English version pretty soon. And this may help, you know, at least from the Latin American perspective, um, for the scholars to have an idea and what is being done so far and how you know the, the the researchers, the faculty, the 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 top scientists in in, in international education, uh, what they may uh, foresee for their upcoming researchers, uh, research research um, topics to help us, the practitioners, to put up the world and and somehow uh, have a, a formal discussion with our local authorities, with our nation authorities, with our national authorities to uh, establish um, educated strategies in order to promote what is to come in international education. So I, I, will, I will leave it there. Thanks, Cesar. Uh, I just wanna encourage everybody to post um, any questions you might have using the Q&A. Um, next, Huang Chi. Okay, thank you. Um... Uh, I think uh, for the uh, uh, critical issues, actually, um, I, I just uh, have a uh, sentence in my mind, uh, which comes from Claude Bernard, uh, art is I uh, and science is we. Um, we all know that the whole human being is now faced with the or challenged by the uh, global issues or the problems, for example, the, the climate change or the energy problem and also the food safety and pollution by the um, chemical uh, uh, materials like plastic, and also the uh, diversity for the uh, uh, lives in the world and, and et cetera. So we do not know uh, what is uh, what we could do if we cannot work together with the counterparts all over the world. Um, so in such a case, I think if we, if we really are responsible for the next generation and for the world to, uh, uh, how to say, to uh, develop the common values, for example, for the uh, development and peace and also de democracy and also the uh, uh, freedom for the human being. In such a case, I do believe the government um, from the different regions should take the responsibility to support the collaborative research. And also besides the government, I think the international associations or the alliance, alliances like API, NAFSA, and also like uh, uh, EAIE and et cetera, they could get their own, uh, how to say, um, advantage to connect the uh, counterparts from the region and also out of the regions. So I'm happy to have this opportunity to uh, talk about the ideas with the uh, representatives. And I, I mean, the uh, friend old and new from NAVSA, from, uh, you know, from the associations regional uh, that we, we could come on the uh, same page that uh, we know where we should go and what kind of the resources we could ask for and what kind of the connection uh, and the bridge we could be. And just now I like the idea that you talk about the diversity of the students. Actually, um, we see a tendency for the digital divide, uh, which is new for the uh, uh, younger generation. We are also faced with the uh, uh, different ways of thinking for the Z um, generation. I mean, the, the, the younger generation. They are digital native, but we are immigrant. So uh, what kind of the bridge we could set up uh, for the uh, researchers who have the common interest and what kind of the information we could share with the uh, practitioners I mean, uh, like the international higher educationists, 
educators and also what kind of access we could find out for the, uh, how to say, sharing of the um, high quality equipment or the facilities, facili uh, not the equipment, but also the experiment um, resources. Like uh, um, just one example, at my university, we have the uh, best equipment for the uh, heart materials uh, research under the uh, um, extreme, um, how to say, extreme uh, circumstances. So we're open for the uh, researchers from all over the world. I know that and I believe that many of the universities in United States uh, in other countries will have such kind of the uh, resources which could be shared for the uh, counterparts and the researchers. So in such a case, I think the sharing access information and bridge could be offered by the uh, collaborations, uh, researchers, and also, also students. So I will stop here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I love what you're talking about, especially with the collaboration and the bridging, which is the whole purpose of this panel today. So we're, we're off to a great start. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Joanna to answer the question of um, what can we do related with scholarship to address some of these critical issues? So I think uh, research are really uh, critical because they help us better understand the landscape that we are operating within. And that means, uh, you know, know more about our students, know more about the changing learning envir environments, more know about technology, about outcomes, about financial challenges that right now so many of our international uh, offices are facing. Um, understand uh, where can we, how we can better manage, um, how we can expand our programming and how can we serve better, very diverse audiences? So it's a combination and a nexus right now that the international education is finding itself. Um, and you know, and NAFSA, we're doing numerous of this kind of programming ranging from the Academy for International Education, which is a year long training program. But out of that, we're learning also what is needed. And so by doing training, which NAFSA is doing quite a bit, um, we are actually conducting research because we're learning. So then we can apply this to, for example, Leadership E-Institute that allows for the kind of executive level uh, training or the management development program. But I think one of the, the often uh, uh, maybe omitted and not enough address aspect is really understanding better how, uh, what is the underrepresentation means really in the field of international education. I did talk about a different demographic of the students, uh, but I also wanted to think about, you know, our staff members. Are we representing everyone? Are we really walking the talk when we talk about DEI? What kind of research should we do, be doing with our students? Why some student groups will not go abroad? Because they cannot afford, because they are fearful, but because they are coming from a different racial, ethnic, historically underrepresented group. So how will we address these challenges that they face because social and economic and, and racial inequalities are very persistent and they are incredibly difficult to to be um, eradicated and that has to be then connected with this new modes of learning we're learning anywhere and everywhere right and and that trend is now emerging very very strongly so again how can our associations help our universities, our members to actually come up with the kind of programming that on the one hand allow us to graduate students on time in a, in a good manner, on the other hand also allow them to learn both the new knowledge, but also the skills that are so important. I know that Cesar at the beginning said something about the data, and I really think this is a very important part. How do we collect data? What kind of data we collect? How do we use the data? 
who is having the access of the data, you know, because it's again, it is about eliminating certain uh, inequalities uh, they do do together. And finally, one last part, and that is working across disciplines. We do need to employ transdisciplinary approaches to what we do and to make sure that different kind of disciplines are represented and then our colleagues, our staff is actually aware how that differences among the disciplines are really implicated what should be the future trajectory of international higher education. So this again nexus of the disciplinary, transdisciplinary training and the role that we, our offices, our association, our universities play in that process. Wonderful. Jeet, it's your turn. Yes. So as I'm going last on this round and first on the next round, I'll try to combine both of them. <laughs> How about that? Um, so as to the organization, uh, as, a, as a representative from AIEA, I'm glad to say that we do collaborate with uh, most major organizations uh, here in the U.S. as well as internationally with, with you know, API, with EAIE, with MPE, uh and others in, in Africa and, and Asia and Europe. So uh, what, in in doing so, what it allows is AIEA as being the SIO serving you know, organization, we try to understand the critical issues that each you know, area is facing, whether it is regional you know, or, or even broader on a global scale. But understanding what international education is facing and what kind of research that we should be promoting among our faculty members. So I'm glad to say that we do that. Uh, we, we have worked with every organizations in the past. And we also try to do that more from a, maybe not a, a pure research, but more from a practitioner point of view, AIEA does sponsor these forums uh, on, a, on an annual basis, about four or five of it. And universities, you know, each university who is granted this, uh, uh, AIA Forum grant have a pivotal role in bringing in the resources into uh, the, the forum that they present. So we're, we're glad to do that. But then again, in terms of the question itself on what kind of a research that we need to uh, take a look at, I would say given the complexity and given the challenges that we are facing, uh, international collaborations tend to focus more on the sciences and technology and all that. But I would say, given the challenges that we have right now, maybe the, re the focus should be more on the social sciences, um, understanding different cultures, uh, diplomacy, the social, social issues that we're dealing in each geographic regions. You know, there's some work to, you know, that has been done in the past in this area, but not as much. So I think in the you know coming years, I think we could you know refocus in that area so that you know all these complexities and challenges that we are facing could be addressed uh, in those you know research studies. We include our students in that research study, not just a faculty driven. Certainly, faculty would be key, but that we would you know do that. And um, I would say that uh, you know Joanna mentioned about. The, the competing uh, things that's happening in the U.S. context about uh, the DEI initiatives and the growth of nationalism, um, they are sort of interconnected uh, because we value so much about diversity. We value so much about justice and equity and inclusion and all that. There is a school of thought that they don't, you know, they don't necessarily agree with that, which kind of you know, brings up the nationalistic viewpoint uh, in the center stage. And where, whether those, you know, thoughts were on the fringes in the past, they had become more mainstream uh, in the recent years. And it's an area of concern that we need, we can address. Because, you know, in my institution, and I'm sure it is true in many institutions that we value as, as higher education leaders, at, at higher education institutions, 
we value public good so much. When we say that, you know, some of the basic tenets of what we do with our students is to how to be a good citizen, telling the truth, you know, honoring the facts. You know, all these things are very important things that we at least, you know, try to instill in our, you know, in our students. But that is not the case right now that, you know, there is a growing trend of changing the facts. You know, you know, changing the reality, not honoring uh, the truth, and it isn't just in the U.S. that is, the, you know, that is happening. Yes, yeah, certainly that is happening here. You know, I see that happening in Brazil. I see that happening in India. I see that happening in China. I see that happening in a number of countries in Europe. You know, this is kind of a growing thing. You know, all over the place. So as international educators, we need to we need to combat that. We need to address that. And I think research information, the information that we get, the hard data that Cesar was talking about, is going to be critically important. Yeah. Because if we don't do that, I worry as a higher education leader, what kind of a future leader that we're going to, you know, graduate, we're going to produce, you yeah. know, when current leaders are doing all these, I would say, nonsensical stuff all over the place, all over the world. And so I think, you know, research in the social science is going to be critically important that we take a look at it, what, what is happening in China, what is happening in Australia, what is happening in, you know, Argentina. These are going to be very important. You know, certainly what is happening here in the U.S. So however we collaborate, you know, collaboration has been key to internationalization of higher education, you know, all along. But I think this is going to be even more challenging and more important, you know, moving forward, in my view. You know, you know countries, institutions, you know, student bodies, you know, certainly technology allows us to do that more. But even, you know, uh, the, the mobility is, yeah, I mean, uh, Dr. Jiang talked about the, you know, impact on the mobility, uh, but it is, you know, it is a good sign that it is coming back. You know, certainly the mobility of students, you know, although it's still, you know, below what it was pre-pandemic, but the increase from year to year, year over year, is very impressive. It is happening. Maybe not true in every country, but, you know, overall, I do see that positive trend that is happening. So I think we need to promote that. We need to capitalize on that. And then, you know, certainly, uh, you know, the collaboration among students, faculty, staff, it's going to be critically important moving forward. Thanks, Chief, for combining the two questions. So actually, yeah. the question we asked for the panelists for the next one was um, to provide us some recommendations for um, researchers and practitioners um, for collaborating. Um, to address the critical questions or critical issues that we are talking about. So I'm going to turn it over to Joanna. Great, thank you. And thank you, Jeanette, for setting up the stage. So the, the, the collaboration between the scholars and academics and the practitioners is definitely key. But I want to bring another group in, and that is policymakers. Uh, one of the things that NAFSA is doing, and I think is doing an excellent way, I will be shameless here, um, is <laughs> the advocacy. The advocacy for higher education is critical. The advocacy for international higher education is even more critical because very often the international higher education is kind of a little bit on, on, on the margin. And yet we need to work with our policymakers at the national level, regional level, to make sure that our international global community, our scholars, students, both who, who are coming to the United States, but also those who are going to other countries are recognized uh, are the pathways to engage in the degree programs is made easy, that the flow of information between our countries is much easier and so forth. So I think that the working with the policymakers is extremely important and advocacy and leadership and with legislation is extremely important for us. 
there is another element of those discussions that is also very important and involves all three groups, and that is the tension between liberal, broad liberal learning and thinking and focus on getting jobs and develop skills. And there is a tension here because so often the focus on development of the workforce and getting skills to our students is omitting the fact that thinking, reflecting, analyzing is actually critical. And that goes back to Jet's point about social sciences and humanities. We cannot have great workforce unless we allow them to develop skills in thinking, being reflective, recognize cultural diversity and difference. So all of these elements come uh, very, very strongly together. And one last element that I would like, well, maybe two. One is networks, the role of networks, international networks, national networks is really critical in facilitating that multi uh, lateralism and partnership agreement, research flow of information. So networks are critical. They provide very important forward thinking avenues for, for working together. And the second thing, we didn't talk much about it, but actually engagement with our surrounding communities. Mm -hmm. We international educators have extremely important uh, responsibility to educate our students when they're going abroad, to allow them to think and learn about the histories of where they are going to be working and living and working. But also we have a responsibility for our own transnational communities surrounding our universities. So engaging with the communities is a must. We need to know whom we're serving, how we are preparing our students to engage with the partners, being capable of working within the global environment. What do we need? How do we be going to become socially relevant, impactful, responsible? Anyway, I will leave you here, but, but you, you, you hear my voice how important it is to be really recognizing the larger context within which the international higher education is operating. And I know NAFSA is doing, so I'm very proud being representing today NAFSA. Thanks, Joanna. I think for the sake of time, Sijar and Guanchi, can you give us like one recommendation from your side? And then I think we can probably address some questions from the audience. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, uh, when we talk about the uh, critical issues, we have seen the uh, diversify, uh, we have seen the various sides of uh, the uh, issues. And also, uh, given the situation that we do not have long time <laughs> to share ideas, I will cut it short. Um, talking about the collaborations, actually, the international educators will have much ideas in common uh, and many ideas in common like uh, uh, information sharing and also research resources sharing open access and uh, and networking and etc for me i'd like to add one point that um like uh, albert einstein has said that the mere formulation of a problem is far more essential than its solution now quite a quite a large number of the collaborations will be focused on the solution and what is the uh, nature of collaboration i think the nature should be focused on a true a, some, on the true problems so for the scientists we do think we need to, uh, how to say, facilitating them to find out the true problems and then focus on the true problems. The co collaborations will be, uh, how to say, productive and will be useful. Um, so now, according to the data of uh, quite a number of the uh, ranking systems, there are quite much data uh, focusing on the, um, how to say, the uh, uh, factors in, 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 in infection um, affection factors and also the uh, uh, like the how to say citation factors and etc but I think another uh, I think the essential thing the true problem should be focused so I just want to mention this one Sitar, you're muted 
My bad. Well, um, I have I have some um, interesting ideas in regards to these last two questions that um, uh, our, our colleague yet has uh, tremendously, you know, joined in order to to synthesize the, you know, the, the ideas. Well, uh, as far as as answering, you know, what are the main suggestions for uh, further research areas related to international higher education, and 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 also uh, some suggestions for scholars, practitioner, that to collaborate in these critical issues. I will I will go further than that uh, by asking uh, the following. I think that we have to ask ourselves among the international education practitioners, faculty, researchers in the global higher education community in general, uh, what have we accomplished so far with the current strategies we have followed during the neoliberal epoch of internationalization? I mean, have we helped to seriously reduce the social and economic gap in our regions through the student and the faculty mobility experiences? Um, have we evolved from a, an elitist model of internationalization to an inclusive one? I mean, remembering that only less than 1% of the student population worldwide have the opportunity of uh, an experience abroad. I mean, and, and not taking into consideration the new ways of internationalization, such as the internationalization of the curricula or the virtual exchange or other uh, emerging uh, strategies that have evolved uh, during the pandemic uh, because of the need of, of doing something, right? So. How we, I mean, how can we impact, you know, the sustainable development goals in a significant way? I mean, have we, you know, the the, the universities and the, um, you know, the the, the I will say, the um, knowledge development society in the higher education is, institutions have done something, I mean, really significant in this regard. So how can we help to reduce a racist xenophobic environment that is hurting in different regions around our global society? I mean, we know what is happening nowadays in, in, in Eastern Europe, you know, in between Ukraine and Russia. And what we have faced in, in, in America, uh, like what just happened in, 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 in Brazil, you know, with the political uh, issues in, in a divided country or what is happening right now in, in, in the U.S. as our colleagues with uh, NASA and EIA uh, appointed earlier during our conversation. So uh, how do we embrace diversity and inclusion? Have we, have we been doing so like seriously? And um, something that Joanna appointed uh, previously, uh, we need to, I mean, how can we work uh, stronger in working in a transdisciplinary approach towards a flexible curriculum for international higher education? How can we do so? Um, and, and, and finally, some of the, of the thoughts that, uh, that I uh, recovered from my fellow colleagues, it's, uh, you know, the advocacy for international higher education agenda to have a conversation with the policymakers. I think that Johanna stated this really clear, and and that that that's something that we totally agree, and and that's the reason that we uh, took a step forward in Latin America uh, with the leadership of, of of the association in Mexico uh, to create something to 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 do a um, a formal report, uh, led by you know by researchers by faculty uh, by leaders in the different uh, countries in Latin America to know what is the state of the art in regards to public policy for the internationalization of higher education. And let me give you a clear example. In Mexico, there is not even a single um, point in the educational plan for the federal government in regards to internationalization of higher education. We are not in the, in the agenda of the, of the federal government. So how can we approach the policymakers and start a conversation? We need to have data. As, as my, my colleague uh, yet said, uh, we, we need to have data 
in order to appoint the, the topics that we need to discuss with the leaders, with the policymakers, in order to move forward. So those are basically uh, the ideas that we have in, in pay. And what we have been doing so far is uh, to put up uh, serious calls for researchers to develop uh, uh, these, the, these ideas. Uh, for instance, before that, I just find that uh, the British Council in Peru and the British Council in Mexico uh, provided some grants, you know, to start researching about uh, what was the state of the art in regards to uh, the public policy for internationalization of higher education in, in, in these particular countries. But I haven't, ha I haven't found so far anything else uh, that is like a comparative report about what is happening in, in our region and how can we work in that regard you know, to go globally, interregionally, right? Among the, the international associations, such as the big umbrella that the Network for International Education Association gather, gather together for most of these important um, associations. So I, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, we actually are, I think three minutes over our planned time. So I'm actually really sad to say that um, you know, we have to kind of end the event here. But before we do so, I would like to thank all the panelists who made um, you know, their time and made themselves available here, sharing really good perspectives. So um, you know, I, I know like we, are, we are not able to see the attendees here, but please join me um, you know, thanking them. Uh, and I know we also had three really good questions coming from the audience. And for the sake of the time, what will happen is Christina and myself will reach out to our panelists and maybe um, you know, gather their responses and thoughts and probably we'll share that uh, with, you know, via email with the attendees uh, of this event today. So again, um, you know, thank you everybody who was on the panel and also who attended the event and also um, you know, Ash Office for allowing us to have this space. And I look forward to see you everyone in Las Vegas in few few weeks. Thanks everybody. Thanks, thank everybody. you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.